Hey friends, it's Mike. It's Thursday. It's April 22nd, 2021 and just before 9 a.m. here on the East Coast. And I wanted to do this uh, channel update. I haven't done a channel update in a while here on my Paul is Dead channel. Um, but I'm going to focus on two things with this update. One is um, to answer three questions, common questions that have come into me over time, especially since I released my big presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music, which was released uh, a year ago on April 1st, 2020. And uh, the other thing I want to do is just talk about an idea that I have about uh, some additional research, analysis, presentation that I'm looking to, um, to put together. I have no time frames for it right now, and uh, I'm going to shy away from putting a stake in the ground and saying, oh, this is when it's going to be out. Because uh, I made that mistake when I was talking about putting the big presentation out and did the Beatles write all their own music. And I originally wanted that out, I think it was September or, or October of 2019. And of course, it just got delayed because of the volume of material that I was going through and then having to piece it together and building the storyline and all that. So again, originally September, October 2019, and I didn't release it until April 1st of 2020 or six months later. So I'm not going to make that mistake again. So uh, for this next analysis that I am looking to do, I'm not sure that I'm going to do it yet. I'm not 100% positive, although I am certainly leaning that way. And that analysis will have to do with the Beatle period between 1960 and 1962, which of course would include their Hamburg days and you know, days of playing the gigs at the Cavern and so on. In my uh, big presentation, I went through some pie charts and some analysis as to where the Beatles spent their time. And in 1962 and 1963, 65% of the days in those particular years, the Beatles did gigs. They were playing live. And uh, some people were critical of uh, the pie chart analysis where I showed that they were playing live on all of these days, two thirds of the year. And they said, well, you're assuming that they didn't write any music on those days. And uh, yes, and there's a good reason for that. And I will get more into that when or if I plan on doing this analysis. But a quick overview would go like this. Uh, the Beatles, when they played those gigs, they might be an hour uh, on those given days. If they were playing the Cavern, that was around two hours. If they were in Hamburg, they were playing six to seven hours a night. And what I'll do is at this point right here is I will insert a clip from a Pete Best interview where he explains um, how much time they didn't have during the day to do anything other than maybe walk around for two hours. They certainly weren't writing music. So let's listen to that clip right now. How did you spend your time outside the club when you were basically through working? What'd you do? Well, by the time we'd finished working, in those days we used to work eight hours a night. We'd start at six and finish at two in the morning during right. the week. What'd you do before? In other words, your basic time for enjoying yourself was mm -hmm. before and maybe a little uh, after, but mo most of the time before. What did you do before, before you went into the club? Well, by the time we'd woken up, it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, great. Now that you had, you know, all sorts of time. You had mm -hmm. two hours to do what? Yeah, well... Did you walk around and you see the rest of Hamburg? Yeah, well, we, you know, the first time we were there, we were like, as well as being musicians, we How were How did tourists. people take, take you when you walked around? Do you walk around in black leather jackets? Uh, after about a month, we walked around in black leather people jackets. People stare at you all the time? Oh, yeah, all the time. Okay, so that interview you just listened to is Pete Best, and again, it goes back years ago, but you can clearly hear what he's telling us, that they had about maybe two hours um, between the time they woke up in the morning and when they had to be back in the clubs in Hamburg. So they certainly weren't writing music when they were in Hamburg. Now, let's just say they were home, they were in uh, Liverpool or the surrounding area and they were doing gigs. And we'll just make it really simple. Let's just say the show that they were going to do or that they did was an hour. And 
a mistake that a lot of people make, and this typically comes from people who don't understand the setup, the, uh, the upfront and the back end of when you play a gig. So you just don't show up, hop on stage, play for an hour, and then leave, right? So we have to figure that during those days, now I'm talking about 1960, 61, 62, 63, okay? Uh, when they were doing all of these gigs virtually 25 out of 30 days in a given month. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how much playing they were doing. And I'll get into why they were doing all that playing in just a moment. But let me just explain why it is that if they do a one-hour gig in an evening or during the day, that it's not just one hour. Okay, so number one, they had to be doing rehearsal. So they had to rehearse all these songs that they were learning. In fact, I will drop in another clip of Billy being interviewed by Ed O'Brien from Radiohead and Billy explaining that they had just learned a ton of songs when they were back in the 60, 61 time period when they were playing Hamburg and when they were doing the Cavern and these other clubs. Yeah. You know, we were starting in Liverpool, just playing as a little crappy group. We really weren't very good. You know, we didn't know much. But then we ended up getting out to Hamburg and we got better. And so we had this lovely build-up um, yeah. where we learned millions of songs in Hamburg. So they had to be rehearsing. Now, I'm not going to say they were rehearsing every single day, but they were rehearsing a lot because they had to get these songs down. So there's rehearsal time, okay? Then if you're going to a gig, you have to get your equipment. You have to load it into your car, your truck, your van, or whatever. You get to the venue. You have to get the equipment out of the vehicle, bring it into the venue, set it up. And depending upon the sophistication of the venue, you might do a sound check. Maybe in some cases they didn't. They just, you know, plugged in, no sound check, and started playing. And then once you're done with the gig, you've got to break down your equipment, put it back in your vehicle, and then either go home or make your way over to the next town or city where you're going to play. Okay, so it's not one hour. It could very well be a three to four hour process to play a one hour gig because you've got a whole equipment around and there's travel time. Okay. Now, so we have rehearsals, and we also have the front end and the back end of going to do a performance. And the other thing is, the Beatles in 1960 and 1961 through 62, in 1960, biological Paul McCartney was 18 years old. Okay? So, we have to put this into real-life context. Young people who are in their late teens, their early 20s, they're not getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's not like they're waking up and Paul wakes up and says, you know, I have to have a hearty breakfast and I uh, have to be ready to go and I'm going to give John a ring and maybe George and Pete Best and we're going to work on writing songs. So, I'm going to eat breakfast and then we're going to get down to business. That didn't happen, okay? I was 18, you were 18, maybe you have um, teenagers. What time do they get up when they're not in school, as an example? Do they get up at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning? No. 10, 11, 12, 1 p.m. I mean, I had this situation with my daughter when she was young. I actually had to go into her room and say, hey, it's time to get up, you know? So, um, and, you, and you heard that in the Pete Best clip, right? They got up at... 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And of course, they were playing into the wee hours of the night. Right? So, we've got we've got sleeping. We've got the preparation to go to a gig. We've got rehearsals. And then you've got all this other stuff that you attend to in life, especially when you're a young person, hanging out with your friends, doing nothing. You know, it's, it's just... It's just very naive and very simplistic to say that uh, on those days where they were gigging, that, that they had the rest of the day 
from 6 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the morning till what? 10 p.m. at night to be sitting down and writing music. And to top it off, we don't have any evidence, really, other than what we're told in official narratives that they actually were writing music. Okay. In fact, what we have, based upon the, uh, the clips I had put in my big presentation of George Martin, that they didn't have anything. When they came to go see George Martin, they didn't have a backlog of songs. And in fact, George Martin said that he thought their music was rubbish. And again, these are not my words, so don't get angry with me. These are the words that came from George Martin. All right, And that's because the truth is hidden in plain sight. And you just have to, you have to see through it. You have to pull the curtain aside and look behind the curtain. So I found the, um, the 1960 to 1961 period and the story around it to be very, very suspect. Now, in the Beatles Complete documentary, which came out in the 1980s, and which pieces of it I included in my uh, four and a half hour presentation, we are told that Paul McCartney and John Lennon wrote 100 original songs between 1956 and 1962. But we don't hear 100 songs coming through between 1960 and 1962. In fact, they're playing covers in 1960. 1961 and we don't begin to see some of the original stuff till around 1962 all right and I believe the reason why we start seeing the original starting in 1962 is because Tavistock was feeding the pipeline they were seeding the band with some uh, quote-unquote original tunes and it's preparation Right? They had to build the backstory. They had to establish a narrative that would have some quote unquote historical baseline for them. But I want to start with uh, 1960 because that's when they started in Hamburg, when the, they were taken to Hamburg by their then manager, Handler, Alan Williams. And, uh, you know, by. Uh, mainstream accounts, the Beatles were not a very good band. They were they were really really rough around the edges. And Alan Williams explains this. Uh, Billy explains this when he tells us about the Beatle history. And for people who are going to say, "Well, Billy lies," I have you know, look, I I've got to be honest with you. I believe Billy has been involved in the Beatles. In the background prior to 1966 I think he's been with them a long time to be honest with you and uh, as part of the uh, the whole psychological operation as part of the uh, the songwriting team that was put together by George Martin and Theodore Adorno okay so I just want to put that in there because you have the, the clues of people out there that all, all they want to do is fall back on Billy's a liar Billy's a liar Billy's a liar and uh, not understanding that uh, Billy has been telling us since day one, when he made his public appearance with Sgt. Pepper, that he's not Paul McCartney. The clues were all there, and he's carried those clues out until this day. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean I love Billy, all right? I always get that nonsense. He loves Billy. Look, I, I've, as I've mentioned so many times, um, in presentations and uh, in channel updates and so on, that I am completely neutral to biological Paul McCartney and Billy. I, I'm a researcher, and I want to keep my research objective and neutral. All right? And so when I talk about Billy not being a liar, was there a deception? Yes, there was a deception. There's no doubt about it. The entire Beatle psychological operation is a deception. It started with the fact that they told you that these four guys started organically. Four lads from Liverpool, middle-class scousers, right? They team up with uh, a small record shop owner, Brian Epstein, who then is able to get them a uh, recording contract with EMI under the tutelage of George Martin. 
and then go on to unprecedented fame and fortune. That didn't happen. That's a fictional narrative. That's a Cinderella story that people love to believe. And trust me, I understand why people want to believe it. It's a feel-good story. So it's very easy to understand why people would embrace it and not want to give it up. But the story is not true, or at least huge chunks of it are not true. So uh, one of the things that um, piqued my interest about the 1960 through the 1962 period was I have this CD here. Let me see if I can get it without the glare. And it's called The Quarrymen, The Dawn of Modern Rock. So I pulled this out the other day and I was looking at the back of the CD case and taking a look at the songs. And there are two songs on here that are Beatle original compositions. One after 909 and I'll Follow the Sun. And so you're thinking to yourself, wow, the Quarrymen? That goes back into the 1950s. And uh, wow, they had One After 909 and I'll Follow the Sun already in the bag. However, when you take a closer look, the front of the CD at the top here, it says, Historical Collector Series, Limited Edition, Rehearsal Demo Recorded April 1960. April 1960, which was three to four months after they arrived in Hamburg. So, again, this piqued my interest because I'm thinking to myself, okay, so it appears that, as I mentioned before, Tavistock was seeding the pipe, right? They were getting it prepared to build the Beatles story. And the reason why the Beatles were doing all of these gigs in 1960, 61, 62 through 1963 was because they were enhancing their performance skills, their ability to learn songs and take them out on stage. That is what that period was all about. When you dig into the 1960 through 62 period, what you don't read and you don't hear is that that was a time when the Beatles were prolifically writing music, writing original compositions. What you do read is that it was very grueling, all of the playing, especially in Hamburg, and that they were enhancing their performance, their playing skills. And the reason why that was done, and the reason why Tavistock had put them on that path was because Tavistock needed them to learn some of these Beatles songs to take out on the road, right? So they had to be a quick study to play these songs and then take them out on stage. And of course, the Beatles touring was extremely grueling as well, starting with their U.S. tour in 1964 and going through 1966. And the other thing that needs to be noted is that the Beatles, between their albums, Please Please Me Through Revolver, and we're talking about their official UK releases and singles that were not on albums, the Beatles released approximately 90 original compositions during that period, 1962 through 1966. When I went back and looked at their set lists for their concerts, they played about 25 of those 90 songs. So what happened to the other 65 songs? What happened to them? Why didn't they play anything from the Revolver album when they were at Candlestick Park in August of 1966? During that tour, they didn't play anything off of the Revolver album, which they just released. So why would they not promote the new album with songs from that album? Right? That's a red flag. What band does that? If a band releases an album, they make sure that they play cuts off of that album. And that didn't happen with the Beatles. And the reason why it didn't happen, my take on it is because the Beatles did not have time to learn the songs. That's why it happened. What they did with Revolver is the same thing they did with Rubber Soul. The songs were already written. 
the instrumental tracks were already done, recorded by uh, studio musicians. The songs were written by professional songwriters. And I would include uh, George Martin and Theo Adorno in that mix, along with writers that they hand-selected from Tavistock slash EMI. Now, some people uh, will say that Theodore Adorno, because this is a uh, kind of a meme that's out there, wrote all of the Beatles' music between 62 and, and until the day he died, actually, in uh, 1969. Uh, but I, I had a hard time coming to that conclusion when I did uh, my big presentation, did the Beatles write all the music, and I dug into Theodore Adorno, because Adorno had a lot of stuff on his plate. Uh, he was a very, very accomplished composer. So there's no doubt that Adorno could have written some of the Beatles' music. Do I subscribe uh, to the position that he wrote all of it? No, I don't. I don't. So I believe that he was in the mix. George Martin was in the mix. Um, in fact, I have a clip of George Martin saying that he wrote the, uh, the, the guitar piece to uh, Michelle. He said that that was his composition. And that completely contradicts the official narrative. Right? Uh, Billy tells us that Michel was written in some, some French pub somewhere. He was sitting in the corner strumming his guitar. Oh, Michel, my bill. You know, some ridiculous story that, that most of the, uh, the Beatle freaks and the, the worshippers just love to embrace. It's a completely bogus story. I mean, it didn't happen that way. And, uh, and that's why I inserted that clip into, uh, into my big presentation from George Martin to show that, hey, it's in all likelihood George Martin wrote most of that song. I mean, that's, that's the conclusion that I came to. The guitar solo in Michelle is my composition. I actually uh, wrote, wrote down the notes. As I play this, George, you can do, do these notes with me on the guitar. I'll play you in That kind of thing. And so, like I said, they had these... Um, these other songwriters that they tapped into, uh, very good songwriters, obviously, that uh, a small clue of them that were putting the music together. And then the Beatles would rehearse those songs, and uh, they learned about 25 out of the 90, and then they took them out on the road. Okay, that's my take on it. So, uh, in any case, what I want to do is, I, I do want to get to the questions, and... Uh, I am looking at uh, investigating and researching the 1960 through 1962 period. That, that's the bottom line. I don't have a time frame. I have been accumulating lots of uh, source data, which includes uh, stuff that's on websites, uh, videos, documentaries, and so on, just like I did with Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? I don't expect this to be four and a half hours, maybe, I don't know, two, two and a half hours at most, but uh, well, we'll see. Um, I am inclined to do it because I, I do believe that this period is very interesting, uh, including, I should add, the DECA audition tapes. Right? That was very peculiar as well because we are told that the Beatles went to DECA and recorded 15 songs within five to six hours, right? The official narrative says that that audition was supposed to start at 10 a.m., but it started at 11 a.m., 11, and then it fish, finished up late in the afternoon, let's just say right before dinner. So we'll say, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock. So we are to believe that the Beatles recorded 15 songs, three of which were original compositions, in five to six hours. I don't believe that story at all. And by the way, 15, one plus five equals six. Um, it's very similar to the story that we are told about Please Please Me. The Please Please Me narrative says that of the 14 songs that were on the first album, Please Please Me, their UK release, their debut album, 10 of those songs were recorded in one day in less than 13 hours. That didn't happen either. Okay? So, 
what we keep seeing is these uh, ridiculous time frames, very compressed time frames around all of these songs that were uh, allegedly recorded in the studio within that very, very compressed time frame. So we have the Decca audition tapes, we have Please Please Me, we have Rubber Soul, we have the, uh, the story that they wrote 30 plus songs while in India, but Ringo left after two weeks, uh, Billy left in less than a month, and only John and George lasted in India 60 days. So the point being is that they weren't even all there contiguously to, to write songs, right? So the whole 30 plus songs in India is a, a nonsense narrative as well, as well as the Escher or Esher, I guess if you're in the UK, it's Esher, the Esher demo that was recorded in um, George Harrison's bungalow, allegedly, 27 songs in one day, a day that is unknown. There is no date for that one day in May of 1968 leading into the White Album recording sessions that this event took place. The recording of the Esher demo. 27 songs, by the way, 2 plus 7 equals 9, right? It's, it's, always, it's always tied to the numbers, always, okay? So, um, yeah, so I do want to cover the 1960 through 1962 period. The more I'm talking, the more I'm thinking about it. You know, it is something I want to do uh, because I don't think it's something that's really been investigated thoroughly. And, uh, and what we're going to find, I think, is that they were writing music. They weren't writing original compositions. They were learning tons and tons of cover tunes. No question about that. And again, that was all done to get the Beatles uh, up to speed, to build their performance skills and their playing skills, so that when Tavistock threw the switch for Beatlemania and the beginning of the psychological operation, right? they were uh, well-versed uh, at uh, learning music, and then taking it out on the road. I think it was John Lennon who said that by the time the Beatles hit America in 1964, in February of 1964, that they were old hands. And, and what John was saying is that they were in the business and well-versed and immersed in what it is that they had to do. In fact, he referred to the Beatles as craftsmen, which has two meanings. One, a craftsman is somebody that has learned a craft, right, is very good at it, and craftsman is also uh, a reference to Freemasonry, okay? So, in any case, I, I know I've been babbling on here. <laughs> just bear with me. So, let me just uh, pause this for a second, and then I will uh, get to the questions, okay? So, hold on one second. Okay, so I'm back. All right, so these are three questions that have come to me recently, and as I mentioned earlier in um, in this video, I think I did, that these are common questions that have come uh, to me, especially since I released a big presentation, and I have been answering them one-on-one, -on -one, so I figured with this video, let me just take the time and, and answer them so that anybody else who has these questions can take a listen without having to write me or leave a comment. All right, so the first email comes to me uh, from a person who has been writing me for a while, good guy. He's a uh, fellow musician. And so his question to me had to do with what to make of these uh, audio clips on YouTube, as an example, of, uh, of the Beatles sounding like they're rehearsing songs or recording the songs for the album tracks. And so I wrote this person back and I said, my take on what we're hearing is twofold. One, I believe it's very possible that those audio clips were staged. In other words, as part of the psychological operation, George Martin knew that he had to leave breadcrumbs out there. So they would come into the studio, he would run the tape, and it would sound like they were recording music, right? So we would hear little snippets of them playing, maybe uh, some bantering, and so on. In fact, 
I have one of these clips in the presentation, Did the Beatles Write All Their Own Music? And it was the song, Think For Yourself. And when you listen to that particular clip, most people, because people like to fill in the blanks, and that's exactly how the psychological operation works. They know that people, based upon the narrative built around the story, will fill in the blanks. All right? So when you listen to that clip for Think For Yourself, you're thinking, okay, well, that's the Beatles recording that song. But at closer inspection, you could tell that George Harrison, who allegedly wrote that song, Think For Yourself, is not familiar with it. He's not familiar with the, the melody. And uh, he and the other Beatles, in particular John and Paul, are really, really struggling to get the harmonies down. Okay? So, I believe that that particular clip had to do with them being in the studio and doing the singing. They didn't do the playing. I'm thoroughly convinced of that. Rubber Soul nailed that one down for me. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, I think the, the model was that uh, studio musicians played the music from 1962 through 1966 on all of the recordings. And some people might say, oh, Mike, are you saying that they didn't play at all on those records? Maybe. Bit parts, maybe. But the parts that really count... Uh, studio musicians were on those recordings and it didn't change up until Billy got them more involved with Sgt. Pepper but even then with Sgt. Pepper that was the Billy show and it's documented not just in memoirs but in mainstream sources that Billy went in and erased tracks and recorded over guitar tracks that were uh, recorded by George and John because he just didn't like what he heard so he knew what he wanted, and he went in and did the guitar work as well. And it wasn't until the White Album that we start to hear more of the Beatles' original compositions and playing on some of the recorded tracks. Although, again, as many of you know, my position is, even through that period, 1967 through 1970, the Beatles were still using um, outside songwriters. And these were songwriters that Billy knew. But in any case, let's go back to these snippets that we hear on YouTube and, you know, some bootleg tracks and stuff like that on old records and CDs. So I believe that um, they were staged. That's part one. Part two would be that, as I mentioned earlier, the Beatles had to learn the music. They had to be taught the songs to take out on the road. So... What we are hearing is George Martin rolling the recorder as they are rehearsing. You can't assume that because it's the Beatles and you're hearing them banter and you're hearing them strum the guitars and singing and stuff like that, that they are recording the song that ended up being the recorded track on the album. You cannot assume that because if you assume it, you are assuming. And if we really dig into uh, really closely listening to the early Beatle material from 1962 through 1966, the playing on those songs is highly, highly polished. Very, very professional. In fact, I had one person who is a very, very accomplished musician and songwriter tell me that the guitar playing on Norwegian Wood was way above John Lennon's play grade way above it. And again, as I mentioned, we have Bernard Purdy coming out and saying that he drummed on 21 early Beatle tracks, and Bernard has been saying that since the 1970s, and he is still saying it to this day. In fact, his book, which I think was published in 2014, has a chapter dedicated to the Ringo Starr controversy, where the controversy was that Bernard came out and for almost... 45 years has been saying that he drummed on 21 tracks. Plus, he drummed, drummed on or redid the drum tracks on some of the Tony Sheridan stuff, material that came out that the Beatles played on. He talks about that too. So that's aside from the 21 tracks, Beatle tracks. He also did work to clean up the drumming on the Tony Sheridan stuff. And then, 
the official narrative tells us that uh, Andy White drummed on P.S. I Love You and Love Me Do. And what's to keep us from believing that if George Martin utilized Andy White for those two songs, why didn't Andy White drum on other songs? And then uh, I had a person who is very much connected into the late Ronnie Verrill, who was another great studio drummer, <clears throat> tell me that Ronnie drummed on Beatles songs as well. Okay, so that's three. Bernard, Andy White, and Ronnie Verrill. You know, so if they were using studio drummers, then what's to keep us from believing that they weren't using studio guitar players and, and bass players? Right? Uh, one name that I think is probably a good name to uh, say was playing on those early tracks is Vic Flick. Vic Flick is a great guitar player. He is a studio musician. And uh, Vic Flick was in the George Martin Orchestra. And George Martin hired him to do the James Bond sounding theme in the beginning of Help on the U.S. release of the album Help. So, okay, so you only hired Vic to play that particular guitar part? Like, he didn't play anything else? All right. And the other thing with um, Beatle music, the recordings, is the impeccability of those recordings. They are very, very polished. So if you go back and you listen to uh, the old Rolling Stones recordings, they don't compare. Uh, Jimmy Page years ago went back and remixed and remastered the Led Zeppelin material, um, you know, because he felt that the mixes and the, and the mastering could have been better. And one example of uh, some sloppiness with regard to a Led Zepp song that was recorded recorded was the Immigrant Song. So if you listen to the Immigrant Song, the original version of it on the vinyl, and even on um, versions of the CD until Jimmy Page fixed it, uh, you hear a lot of analog tape hiss at the beginning of that song. You would never, ever hear that on a Beatle track, ever. So the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of care was taken to make those Beatle recordings pristine so that they would hold up over time, which they have. Those recordings going back from 1962 through 66 and even beyond, 67 through 70, but especially that 62 through 1966 period is really phenomenal. Okay, so anyway, so the, what we're hearing, I believe, when we hear these audio clips of them strumming, playing, singing and whatnot is staged. Okay, because George Martin knew that he had to leave breadcrumbs out there. And uh, two, they were uh, recording rehearsals of them being taught and learning the songs so that they can ultimately take them out on the road. And of course, they only took 25 of those 90 songs out on the road. They didn't learn all 90 songs. And uh, in fact, in the Candlestick concert, in 1966, their last concert, uh, and, and that entire tour, as a matter of fact, they didn't play, like I mentioned, anything from Revolver. I mean, they couldn't even play uh, Yellow Submarine, which was on the Revolver album. This is something that Ofer Zevi brought up uh, when he interviewed me, uh, the 11 questions on the McCarty and Beatles conspiracy, and he was spot on. He was right on the money. Okay? So, in any case, I went on with this email. Let me read it here. Um, I just talked about these recordings and what we're hearing. And then I said, the Beatles are the most famous rock band in history, and yet we have no film or video footage of them rehearsing and working in the studio as part of creating an album. How is it the most famous band in the world has no public video record or archive of their endeavors in the studio until we get to Let It Be? And even with Let It Be, the proof that the Beatles are actually on the recorded tracks is inconclusive. Okay, so I'm not saying that the Beatles didn't play on any of the Let It Be tracks. In fact, the playing to me sounds like they did play on most of those tracks, but I would not 
discount uh, the possibility and probability that Billy redid some of those tracks either on his own or with studio musicians. And the proof that Billy was very invested in Let It Be is when he went back and he created the Let It Be Naked version of the of the album, right? Because Billy didn't like the Phil uh, Spector wall of sound stuff and all the orchestration, and Billy wanted that stuff stripped out. So that tells me Billy was very invested in Let It Be, and he wanted that record uh, to come out the way he wanted it to come out. So, you know, when you have that type of investment, that means to me that uh, you're also going to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed with, re with regard to the recording of the tracks that ended up on the album. And then I mentioned The Elephant in the Room, uh, which cannot be explained away by any musician or songwriter who is honest, and this is very important, if they're being honest, is Rubber Soul. 16 songs plus a flexi disc in 30 days, writing from scratch, rehearsing, arranging, recording, 16 top shelf songs in 30 days did not happen. The only way it's possible to believe is to believe that John and Paul were these musical geniuses, which they were not. They were just four guys that were handled and groomed to be part of a massive psychological operation. You know, I know a lot of people hate when I say things like that, but that's where I have landed on it. And I'm 100% sure that what I'm saying and what I believe is true. So then I gave an example of how is it that John Lennon, who is uh, credited with writing the great song In My Life, right, a song that is considered to be one of the top rock and roll songs of all time, and by the way, Billy came out a couple of years ago and said that he wrote the music and John wrote the lyrics. So Billy's dropping a little clue there, in my view, that he was involved with the Beatles before Sgt. Pepper. So it goes back to at least when In My Life was written, but I believe Billy goes back into the early 1960s behind the scenes. Uh, but in any case, so you know, we have John writing this brilliant song, allegedly, and then seven years later, he releases Sometime in New York City. An album that really is very, very poor. And in fact, uh, John caught so much flack and negative reviews for that album that uh, it was then that he did an about face and said he would never go do something like that. He was very involved with the, uh, the counterculture at that time, the Jerry Rubens of the world and stuff like that. But you have to ask yourself, where did the songwriting prowess go? Seven years earlier, we are told that he wrote In My Life, and then seven years later, he is writing and playing the tripe that is on the album sometime in New York City. So then I went into a quick story. This is one email, by the way. Yes, it was a long email. And I said, I've had a number of people reach out to me while I was doing the work, especially when I was doing uh, the big presentation. And these people are in the business and one person who shall remain nameless but is connected into the Beatles machine and did studio work this is what they told me for John Lennon at Apple as well as having Billy playing on an album that they released back in the early 1970s I do have proof that Billy did play on this person's album he sent me the proof and this individual a good guy okay I had a pleasant time speaking with them and emailing and we I think we spoke on the phone about three times and maybe we had maybe a half a dozen email exchanges and he was trying to convince me that the lads recorded Rubber Soul and um, this person is an accomplished musician and I asked him during our last phone conversation I said you are a songwriter and an accomplished musician and he said yes and then I asked him, I said, can you write, rehearse, arrange, and record 16 songs in 30 days? And there was a pause. And then he had to admit that, no, it was not possible. And then I said to him, well, there you have it. So the point being is that every musician and songwriter that I have spoken to who is being honest will admit it cannot be done. And for me, Rubber Soul is a monstrous hole in the Beatles narrative. And... Um, it didn't happen the way we were told. 
And the thing is, you know, most people uh, didn't dig in. They didn't analyze it. And I'm not saying I'm the only one. There had to be other people that did, but um, it didn't go as public as maybe my work did on it. But most people, the vast majority of folks, just take the, the narrative that's handed to them and they run with it and they don't question it because they don't think to question it. It's like, well, why would I question that? You know, it's what it says in this book. It's what it says in that documentary. That's what they're saying in this interview. Why would I question it? Right? Not realizing that it's all a fictional narrative or most of it is a fictional narrative. Okay, so that was that was uh, email number one. And then uh, I got the second one, and this person wrote me and said, I watched an interview with Pete Bess, and he was asked about the band going into the studio, and he said that when they got there, George Martin gave them songs that he wanted them to do, and that Lennon and McCartney went home and said, this is rubbish. He said, and he's talking about Pete Bess, that when John and Paul went back to the studio, they refused to do these songs, with Lennon being the most vocal of them all. This interview with Pete was done when he was young. And then this person goes on to say that although I can believe that the Beatles didn't write all the songs, I can also believe when they first went in to record that they could have easily had 20 songs or more between them. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier in this video, there's no proof of that. There's no hard proof of that. There's no direct proof that they had all these songs. We have narratives that want to tell us this, but once we start to dig in, it, it's not there. You know, it's, it gets very, very foggy. So then he goes on to say that you know, he was um, working with a friend of his. This guy's a musician as well. And that uh, in three months together, they had written at least 20 songs. And so the premise being that, hey, if we can do it, they can do it. And I hear this a lot, right? This is a, a common uh, argument that a lot of people like to bring up. So my response back to this person uh, was this, Pete Best is part of the machine, and because Pete is part of the machine, you're not going to get disclosure from Pete. And then went on to say, if you listened to the interview I did with Ed Opperman, this is the recent interview I did with Ed, we talk a bit about May Pang, and I explained that people that are in the Beatle machine are sworn to secrecy. So they're not going to let the cat out of the bag. I mean, it's just the way it works. So I went on and uh, further explained that the Beatles had little to no backlog of quote-unquote original songs when they signed with EMI in June of 1962. And there's no way a bar and club band was going to lay down any rules with George Martin and EMI. Refusing Martin or arguing with him would have been career suicide. So in my opinion, Pete's version of the tale did not happen. In my presentation, I have a clip of George Harrison saying that the Beatles had no input in the early days, and we're talking about the 1962 through 1966 period. And also in my presentation, we hear in George Martin's own words that he thought their music was rubbish and they had nothing behind them. And then I said, people often ignore what they don't want to hear or believe, but that does not make the lie a truth. Whenever we hear or read stories about their stint in Hamburg and the Cavern, we never hear or read that that's when they learned to write music. What we are told is that's when they learned a ton of songs and learned to become performers. In a recent interview with Ed O'Brien, this is the interview I mentioned earlier from the band Radiohead, Billy again tells us the early gigs, 1960 through 1962, were all about learning cover songs and performing live. So then I talked about the, uh, the fictional narrative around Please Please Me. And um, then I said that the Beatles were not studio musicians. They were a club and bar band. And what we are hearing on those early albums are studio musicians hired by George Martin. Martin had immense responsibility as one of the primary managers directing the PSYOP. He was not sitting down and nurturing four 20-year-olds on how to write and record music. He was on the hook to deliver two albums a year, and he was on a tight schedule. To do this, the songs were written by professional songwriters under the direction of George Martin and Theodore Adorno, 
as the lads were out and about playing gigs, doing press conferences, making movies, touring worldwide, partying, and taking time to eat and sleep. Now, not, let's not forget, in my big presentation, um, I have a slide which covers an article, a mainstream article, which has John Lennon in an interview saying that they were in a haze of marijuana while they were filming the movie Help. Okay, so it goes back to what I was saying before. Young guys. And by the, the time they got to Help, they were in their 20s, and they were partying, right? Smoking their weed, drinking. Um, John even said in that interview that they were popping speed uh, amphetamines in, uh, in Hamburg in order to be able to keep going. These are not attributes that contribute to the process of creativity in writing music, right? And then I went on to say that once the music tracks were completed by the studio musicians recorded by George Martin, the lads came in to sing the vocals. And in fact, in my presentation, I have a, a brief audio clip of Martin saying that he really liked their voices. All right, so then uh, I continued on by saying that I have musicians and songwriters tell me all the time they can crank out songs. And the question we have to ask is, what is the quality of those songs? I can write five songs in a day, but are they any good? Meaning, would I record them? Would I release them? Would the record company accept them? And then I told a little story about George Harrison. George was sent back to the drawing board when he originally handed in his songs for his album somewhere in England because Warner Brothers told him, nope, go back and record better songs. So here we have an example of a record company telling a former Beatle his songs were not up to speed. And then I added, then we are to believe Pete's story about the Beatles pushing back on George Martin and that we have to put all of this into the context of reality. Part of that reality is the record companies call the shots. It is true today, and it was especially true back in the day. So many people love the Cinderella story because it is a great story. It feels good, but it is fiction. The lads were not musical geniuses. They were four guys who were groomed to play their part in a massive psychological operation that continues on today. Okay, so that was that email. Okay, so now you're probably seeing why I want to do this in a video. I can't keep typing these things out. So this question came to me as a comment on my YouTube channel, and um, it's a good question. Mike, if the Beatles used mainly studio musicians on many of their albums or most of their 62 through 66 albums, how do you account for their live concerts or TV appearances? Were they being dubbed or lip synced? So I responded by saying that we have to differentiate between studio recording and playing gigs. As I've said many, many times, the Beatles can play their instruments. I've never said the Beatles could not play guitar, drums, and bass. What I have said is that their playing skills were that of a bar and club band, not studio musicians. But again, that does not mean that they could not play their instruments. However, they were not studio level musicians, meaning they did play when they performed live and toured. But aside from Billy, they, the Beatles, including Biological Paul, were not skilled enough on their instruments to play on the recorded tracks. George Martin and later Billy, once Billy took over the band with Sgt. Pepper going into the White Album and so on, hired studio or professional musicians to record the albums and singles. Now, again, I want to add that when Billy was there, um, I do believe that George and John and Ringo did play on more of the recorded tracks, but not on all of them. Uh, one example would be uh, Lady Madonna. I don't believe Ringo played on Lady Madonna, and I also don't believe that John and George played on that song either. Uh, another song which I always found uh, it's a great song I mean the guitar work is is great the the, the, the chord picking um, is unbelievable is uh, I want you she's so heavy now the actual lead part in that song I want you she's so heavy 
is not that difficult. It's essentially a pentatonic box scale that, that is being played, okay? So it is possible that uh, John did that part of the song. However, the dual guitars that are picking, that is precision like you would not believe. And I have not seen any proof that either George or John had the playing skills to be able to pull that off. So I believe that part of the song was done with studio musicians. Okay, again, these are just my thoughts. As I listen to the songs more and more now, uh, you know, I pick these things up. As an example, here's a good example. If you want to hear Ringo drum, listen to the song God by John Lennon. That's Ringo on drums. And especially listen to his fills at the end of that song. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that. And Ringo is doing his fills. They're very stiff and they're a bit clunky. And uh, he pulls it off. That's fine. But if you go back and listen to the early recordings, Day Tripper, as an example, you know, with, with the drums rolling in, that's not the same drummer. It is not the same drummer. Also, I read a long time ago that Ringo couldn't do a drum roll. Yet at the beginning of All You Need Is Love, what do we have? We have this very long drum roll. Well, did he do that? I don't know. In any case, uh, let me see. We, <laughs> let me get back to uh, the email here. Uh, I said that the, the lads weren't skilled enough on their instruments to play on the recorded track. So George Martin hired studio musicians. And what many people do not know is back in the day when a band performed on TV or in a video, many times the music was not live. They either played to the actual recording from the album, sometimes they even lip synced, or there was a backing track that was created for that appearance and they sang live. A great example of this is the official video of the Beatles playing Revolution. In this clip, the Beatles are singing live to the actual song's backing track. However, they are not playing the music that we hear in the video. The guitar playing is being mined. This is very obvious by watching George play, who looks like he's strumming to an easy listening John Denver song. The video was edited to ensure none of the guitar riffing and lead guitar work was shown. It's an illusion. It's another example where the fan fills in the blanks. Ah, yes, the Beatles are playing Revolution Live. No, they are not. And then I went on a little bit to explain how the guitar sound, that distortion on Revolution was achieved and it was done by plugging directly into the board versus going through an amplifier. And then I ended the email by saying that the use of studio musicians on recordings is very, very common and has been forever. And it's still being done today. And I suggested that they watch the documentaries, The Wrecking Crew and Hired Gun and that both those documentaries are extremely enlightening. So again, anybody who's listening to this and you haven't watched those two documentaries, The Wrecking Crew, in fact, can be watched on YouTube. It's also on Netflix, I think, and uh, Hired Gun as well. I think Hired Gun's on Netflix or Amazon Prime. And Hired Gun is great because that's the modern era. And I forgot which guitar player it was. In any case, he's a studio musician, studio guitarist. And he said, hey, you know, people believe that Joe Perry played uh, on those uh, Aerosmith tracks. And in fact, um, some of that playing was done by me, by that particular guitar player, right? That's an eye opener. I'm assuming there are Aerosmith fans listening to this right now. And you, your eyes probably went like, got really wide, like what? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's true. Okay, so that when Joe played live, he had to be taught those guitar parts. That's how it works. That's all for this video, folks. I've been going on here for, it looks like about an hour. Wow, all right. So uh, some things that might be coming along, the 1960 through 1962 analysis. Again, it's gonna take some time. There's no due date, maybe sometime this year. I don't know, okay? Comment section is open. You guys have a great day and we will talk soon. Thanks.